Thank you. Thank you, organizer Sam and others for the invitation and really to, to be here. It's a pleasure. So I was sort of tasked with trying to provide something of an overview of the, of the history of the steels, uh, which is a bit of a tall order. So I, I'll try to do so in the next 15 minutes or so, you know, uh, so it's, it's a fast overview, but also of a very fast time, right? It's an incredibly fast time in, in the steel. The field has been around for several decades, uh, but the last couple of years really seem like just uh, an absolute renaissance. Uh, and, and so the history of working structure prediction and design and so on. And I'll try to capture some of this during my talk. So, so I'll start and I'll remain there for, for the bulk of the talk on the problem of protein structure prediction, the kind of the forward direction. Uh, but I'll, I'll repeatedly kind of allude to the, to the inverse direction, the design, the design question. Can everyone hear me, by the way? Should I speak up? Okay. So the, the, the forward direction, or the basic physical problem here is that you're, you're in the cell. You're typically sort of presented you know, in, as a cell with, with a, a protein that is initially synthesized as a sort of a strain, right? It's kind of a beads on a chain type of, type of representation. And, and through the physical process, basically just really, really the, the, the physics of self-assembly, that string assembles into a three-dimensional structure, a well-defined 3D shape, right? And that shape drives its function, right? So, so I'm thinking in the context of design already, if, we, if we're trying to design proteins with prescribed functions, oftentimes that sort of reduces to designing proteins with, with prescribed shape, with, with a kind of implicit assumption that, that shape bestows a, a given function, right? So, so there's a kind of tight coupling between structure and function. In the, in the kind of prediction, in the forward prediction task, right? So that's, that's the physical process, but in the computational process, what we're trying to do is, to, given a protein sequence, predict the structure of that, of that protein, I predict, predict its shape. And I'll use shape and structure interchangeably. And then at the inverse process, as, as you may imagine, the design process is, given a certain shape, right, produce a sequence that would materialize that shape, right? And that's sort of the design process. But, but we'll, we'll spend a bit of time on, the, on that first direction, because that, the, the forward direction is one that, that actually, I think, underpins much of the advances that have, that have occurred in the, in the inverse direction as well. So proteins come in, you know, come in all shapes and sizes, natural proteins, as well as human designed ones. And, and, and the reason why, why this has been a challenge historically is that experimentally determining the structure of those proteins is not trivial, right? There, there are many methods that do exist and, and they have different sort of trade-offs, but, but the kind of the bottom line is that they're still fairly expensive. They, they used to be much more expensive. They've gotten considerably cheaper, but it remains the case that, that at least for difficult protein targets, it's easily in the thousands and tens of thousands of dollars you know, per, per structure determination. And so, so this has sort of created this kind of imbalance, right? Where on the sequence side, uh, the, the, the advances in DNA sequencing technology have gotten us to a point where nowadays there are potentially tens of billions of proteins whose sequences have been determined, right? So that, that space is incredibly well characterized. Conversely, on the structure side, experimentally at least, there's only a few hundred thousand protein structures that have been determined experimentally. So this is a very big delta, a very big gap, right? And th this has sort of historically been one of the kind of the key, almost outstanding challenges in, in biochemistry as a whole, right? Now, now, you know, you, I think you already know, but, but I think you, you may rightfully ask, well, well, why do we care about structure so much? I sort of already intuited this by, by the association between structure and function, but let me kind of try to break this down a little bit more. So, so particularly, particularly in the forward direction, when we're talking about structure prediction, right? Rational drug design is one of the kind of the most off-sighted reasons for, this, for, this, for the need for this technology, right? And the idea is as follows, right? If you have the, the structure of a protein, you could essentially sort of infer from it something like a molecular surface. That, 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 that the protein presents to, to the cell and to any sort of other biomolecule or small molecule that might engage with it, right? So, so if you're a medicinal chemist, trying to think about how do I design a protein, I'm sorry, how do I design a drug that modulates this protein, having the surface provides you with a sort of a, a basis to generate hypotheses as to what sort of molecules can engage that protein, right? And that, that's one reason why protein structure prediction can be quite empowering for drug discovery and why there's been so much interest in, in, in industry. Now, beyond, put, beyond rational drug design, there are many sort of other applications that, that essentially fall into the category of function determination, right? And this goes back to this sort of tight coupling between structure and function, right? That, that, the, kind of the underlying premise here is that if we know something about structure, we can make some inferences about function, and that's why this is, this is valuable. And including, for instance, I mean, the last bullet point here is important uh, in terms of inferring uh, consequences of genetic variation, right? Uh, so, 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 so it particularly you know, sort of you know, cl uh, clinical alleles, right? alleles that we see that, that, are, that are associated with certain diseases, having structure often can inform what that mutation might be doing to that protein, essentially. And, and more for the, for the focus of this workshop, obviously, is protein design, as, as sort of we, we've talked about earlier, where having the, the capability to design proteins with prescribed structure implicitly means that you may be able to do so with, with, with the prescribed function, and that's a very useful property to have. So, so now let me kind of get into the, the history of this a little bit, because it really has been sort of a remarkable 
few years in the States, right? So, so the field has been around, like I said, for several decades. And, and historically, the, the kind of, I guess, the initial class of approaches that they tried to tackle this problem were very physical in nature. So the idea there was, we start with essentially F equal MA, right? Newton's laws, right? it's kind of really basic physical laws, and combine them with what's called Monte Carlo or MC, which is essentially kind of a sampling procedure. And what this allows us to do is you start with essentially this sort of initial string, right? the, the unstructured string, and by applying kind of approximations, you know, sort of classical approximations of quantum mechanics effectively, you can sort of proceed to, to fold the protein, to actually generate the 3D structure. And, and this is an example of a simulation. This was done a long time ago by BJ Pani's group at Stanford, where, where you actually sort of recreate that physical process, right? Um, and this is very nice because it actually provides you not just with the final structure, but with something uh, about the folding process, the dynamics in which that structure arises. So that, that's very, very useful uh, because oftentimes this folding process may provide intermediate structures that could be targetable, for instance, by drugs. The challenge, though, with this sort of approach is that it's very expensive computationally. So, so it's never even, you know, even though this has been around for decades, even today, it really remains still the case that it's impractical to, to do a physical simulation to, to fold a, a large enough protein to its sort of actual structure. If, if you're starting from that completely unstructured state, it's, it's just too expensive, right? And so, so this, this, while sort of very kind of physically uh, motivated and, and elegant in many ways, is, is not a practical solution to kind of the protein structure prediction problem. To, to get around this problem, I, I think this, I would say, maybe it was in the mid to late 1990s, this, this approach was pioneered actually by David Baker's group. This notion of fragment assembly came on the scene with the idea that we, we can still try to do something like the, the physical simulation, but we essentially sort of supplement it with data-driven observations. And, 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 and as, I'll, I'll, as I'll sort of describe the history of this field, you'll see that we sort of moved from more physics-based approaches, more things that are sort of driven by human expertise to data-driven approaches, including in the, the present, which is almost entirely data-driven. But at the time, in the, kind of the mid-1990s, this was still sort of in between. So, so the idea here was to say, okay, well, we have already a large database of known protein structures. What if we essentially try to identify local sequence structure correlations. So, so what I mean by that is, are there certain sequences that seem to consistently have preferences for structural uh, motifs or structural fragments? And if we have this sort of database, then maybe we can put, derive a process similar to the first one, so the physical one, but now sort of informed by this data-driven observations, set of observations, right? And in, in, in the following sense, in that we can sort of start with a, with a, with a structure that, that is maybe something like what we want, we still have a physical energy function that assesses how good that structure is, right? How, how minimized in energy it is. But then we can now move in structure space by considering that sort of library of, of associations that we know about. And every time we sort of consider one of those moves, we assess its influence on the energy. And if it's sort of a favorable move, we make it. And if it's an unfavorable move, we don't make it. So this approach, again, was sort of nice in principle, faster than the molecular dynamics approach, but in general, still struggled with the challenge of just a very large space of possibilities that you couldn't really apply it at scale to, to actually resolve the structure. Uh, and so, so often the way it was ultimately used was that you start with a sort of what's called a template, a hypothesis as to the final structure, and then perhaps locally refine it to get a better structure. But you wouldn't be able to sort of start from scratch and resolve, resolve the, um, the, the, the answer. And, and I think an implicit issue here as well is the fact that the underlying physical energy function has never been good enough, really, to sort of fully trust it to actually guide you to the down truth. Right? So, so there have always been issues, limitations, approximations in those physical functions that prevented them from being sort of fully sufficient to truly give you the right answer. So this was, I would say, much of the 90s and, and 2000s, in fact. And then in the early 2010s, an idea sort of was revived that, that, that dated back to the 1970s called co-evolution or co-variation analysis that relied very, very tightly on the concept of, of the evolution of protein sequences. And in particular, the idea here was, and I'll make this up in a bit more, is that you can observe a sequence or a set of related protein sequences. And from those observations, you can make inferences about which amino acids in the protein are actually close in proximity in 3D space. And I'll, I'll, I'll unpack this in a second. So, so you, you go from the sort of sequence information, which I said earlier is going in leaps and bounds, to sort of spatial constraints. So something that tells you which amino acid residue is interacting with which. And that, through essentially a process of, of imp imposing geometric constraints on something like fragment, fragment assembly or even molecular dynamics, could actually derive and guide the, the kind of folding process to the final native state, to the final three-dimensional structure. 
and this this was obviously was, I would say sort of a conceptual evolution. I, I think that really moved the field forward more so than any other advance. I would argue even Aufholt since then, and and, and I'll, I'll sort of ex explain in a minute how how this ultimately kind of materialized. But but the, the basic idea, just because it's worth sort of describing, is that you start with this initial protein sequence, and you uh, you obtain a set of related sequences of hom homology homo homologous sequences. Uh, in those sequences, there will be certain positions in the protein that are highly conserved. Those are sort of not particularly useful. There will also be positions that are highly variable, and, and those too are not particularly useful. Uh, but then there will be positions which are co-evolved. And, and the, the notion here is that these are sort of pairs of residues, or pairs of protein positions, which seem to change in concert. So when one evolves, the other evolves along with it, right? And, and the kind of the basic hypothesis here is that this information provides, like I said, spatial, spatial information because it suggests that those two amino acids are somehow codependent. And that codependency may arise by virtue of their proximity in 3D space. Right? And that's kind of the key translation from evolution to, to 3D space. Right? So, so this was sort of a key idea. It didn't actually, in the very beginning, have an immediate impact, but, but it eventually did. And I'll, I'll come back to that in a, in a moment. OK, so now let me step back for a moment. So, so up to late 2010s, right? Protein structure prediction looked a bit like this. Now, I'm not going to describe every component in the system. My point only is to say that it was very complicated. It had many pieces, including the coevolution piece, the fragment assembly piece, the physical function piece. And those components were human designed. They often amounted to millions of lines of code, including like Rosetta, for instance, from, from the Baker Lab, and others, of course, from the Rosetta community. And it, it sort of it, it represented decades of human ingenuity, but it also represented decades of human assumptions, right? Which, which is, I think, one of the key, key issues here. And, and I always draw a parallel between where the field was in 2018 and where computer science was 10 years prior. Where if, if you were to look at fields like computer vision, natural language processing, speech recognition, they looked a lot like this, where there were complex human design systems with very many components, and they had many, many assumptions, right? And what happened in this field was this sort of deploying evolution that I think probably everybody's aware of now, we, we think of it today as AI, but it started from a fairly technical kind of set of innovations having to do with this notion of end-to-end -end differentiability, where you essentially reformulate these very complex problems as basically giant neural networks. And you sort of differentiate or optimize, optimize your way through the entire system. And this was really quite crucial to, to all the progress we'd seen during the 2010s in computer science. But protein structure prediction, even till 2018, really lagged behind and was sort of in kind of the prehistoric, if you may, kind of age. So, so this sort of posits this sort of idea, which I think was bubbling around the time in 2018, of you know, can we bring this, these, these sets of notions to, to protein structure prediction? And in particular, just to kind of make it more concrete, so the notion here is that you build a system which takes a sequence as input, produces a structure as output, and critically, every single piece of it is a neural network. So there's no longer a notion of a physical energy function, no, no longer a notion of, of, of sampling or, 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 or simulation. It's all done implicitly through a neural network. I'll, I'll make one sort of shot at the work that I had done, which I think I believe was sort of the first system to sort of materialize this idea for protein structure prediction. It had limitations, and you know the the the, the, the neural networks weren't sort of as advanced as what would be ultimately necessary to really solve this problem. But this was sort of an approach that that was sort of first to kind of conceptualize and materialize this this basic idea. And this was in 2018. Now at the same time, there's been ongoing for for two decades now a sort of a competition that assesses the quality of protein structure prediction in a blind fashion across, across the globe. And this happened every two years. And, and if the one way of, of quantifying progress is this GDT metric, which ranges from zero to 100, zero being very bad, 100 being very good. And, and as you can see from, from this figure, right, over a 12 year time span, we, we essentially had very little progress, right? It was, so it was sort of saturated, or not saturated, but just stagnant rather, which was far from saturated. And, and lo and behold, right, in, in, in the late of 2018, the first sort of alpha system that emerges, sort of is announced by DeepMind, and, and we see a, a sort of a materially meaningful advance, right? Not, not good enough yet to actually be useful for biological purposes. So, so it was more of a technical methodological advance, but nonetheless an advance. Interestingly, this system didn't yet sort of fully adopt this notion of, of a fully neural network-based kind of folding system. It's still it was still a hybrid system, so it's sort of harkened back to the olden days, but introduced fairly complex neural networks that were able to really move the needle on this problem. But the big advance came to use after, in 2020, when, when the Alpha 2 system was deployed, and this actually was essentially the third system, really, that, that was a fully end-to-end -end differentiable neural network system. So this, this sort of really leaned into that idea and formulated the, 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 the challenge as, as a, entirely as a neural network. Right? So now we've moved 
from, from having a fully physics-based system to a system that was entirely devoid of physics, right? There was literally no, no physics, no, no, no sort of prior, you know, a tiny, tiny little bit of, a, of an inductive prior as to what we understand about these systems, but by and large, really just pure neural networks, right? which were just sort of quite remarkable. And of course this, so I, I won't go into the architecture, but just on a way, one, one, one point here is that a key, a key to making this work, say relative to the system that I, I had developed that's based on neural networks, was the incorporation of co-evolution. So that idea ultimately proved key to making these things work. Right? So, so it wasn't, you know, I said it's sort of there's no physics, that that's true, but it's not like there's no biology in a way. And, and the key biological kind of prior was, was the introduction of these co-evolutionary or evolutionary related sequences, the one in the top left, that was kind of a key part of the architecture that allowed these models to sort of reason, not on individual protein sequences, but on related sets of protein sequences. And that, that's what really made this work. So sorry, in, in a way, I think it's a bit unfortunate that, that that kind of key piece of the piece of the puzzle hasn't been maybe as well recognized. But nonetheless, obviously, I mean, our fault too, I think was a remarkable achievement. You know, there's ton, tons, of, tons of interest already very in essentially the first week uh, from, from, the, from the community as large and in even the science community at large. And, and you know, not, not very long after, this was recognized just uh, late last year by, by the Nobel Prize, which I think is quite, quite fast. I can't remember that many, that many instances of a, of a sort of scientific breakthrough being that quickly kind of captured. So uh, I'm, I'm almost done, but let me just now kind of get to the protein design piece. So, so meanwhile, while this, this is all happening, right, there was sort of a parallel evolution happening, not, not in protein world, but in, in the generative AI world, right? Um, and and the, I, I, I'm going to try to simplify it for, for now, which is just to say, but the key idea here was that unlike in prediction, where we go from, a, from say, a sequence to a structure, in the generative AI world, new methods were emerging that were sort of iterative. And that, that's one key distinction, which is to say, we're not going to make a prediction or, or, or a generation by, by sort of a single shot, but instead we're going to essentially take something like, say, a, a white noise and gradually turn that white noise into something that, say, looks like a picture of an animal. Right, and and this I'm, I'm going to leave it at this level of resolution in terms of the description. But this basic sort of approach has now resulted into sort of these very photorealistic images, and, and even more recently videos that essentially are indistinguishable from from real videos. Right, so these are all completely completely human generated images, um, not in the sense of like a movie where a human a human sits down and you know creates objects that get rendered into three dimensional uh, images. These are entirely you know computer generated just driven by, say, a paragraph of a prompt that describes what the video should look like, right? And so it's, it's really been quite remarkable seeing that that capability essentially emerge over the course of a, of a few years. So that's, that's the, the vision world. Now, what does this mean for protein structure, right? And the, the idea, basically, is that we could, we could apply a similar idea. We could, we could sort of iteratively refine white noise into protein structures, either in the sort of unconditional manner that gives you any kind of structure, or one that, say, assumes a certain motif or certain property that's what's highlighted in blue and materializes a protein that, that captures that property, right? And I would say that the pioneering method in this space has been RF diffusion from the Baker Lab, which, which sort of incorporates the kind of awful like mach machinery, but now repurposes it for the task of protein design, right? Using this kind of iterative approach with, with, with structure prediction as sort of an oracle that really informs that process. Uh, and this has allowed us now to essentially specify properties that we would like to see in proteins, such as symmetry properties or a binding target, if it's, it's a small molecule or a protein, or even say functional motifs like an, an enzymatic active site and, and essentially design proteins around those, those properties. So I'll end with this sort of modern, you know, protein design workflow, which is really emerged, I would say, in the kind of post of diffusion world, where you start with some sort of design spec, that might be a structure, a sequence, or a function, something that you'd want your protein to have. You essentially use these kind of diffusion models, they're called diffusion models, the generative AI, AI, AI stuff that uh, materializes the structure with that property. And there are many methods that do this, but our diffusion is kind of the leading method. Oops, there's a bit of a... So, so that then is converted into a sequence. Let's say you have to go from the sequence to the structure. That's the inverse part through an inverse folding method. Protein MPN is probably the most famous one. And then you go back to the structure to essentially ensure self-consistency between what you've tried to design and what that thing looks like. And that's typically done by a protein structure prediction method like Ahofold. And so altogether now, this is really provided as sort of a, an end-to-end -end workflow that allows us to go from design certifications to at least hypothetical sequences that we can test in the lab. And, and I, I would say has improved so that our hedge rate just in the last year and a half by maybe a factor of 100, which has really been quite remarkable. So I think I'll stop here, and if there's time for a question, I'll take any, but I'm also happy to take them later on. Thanks for your attention.